Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, so first to start, I am over at Boston Children's with my senior partner, Dr. Aaron Green, who's the director of the lymphedema program there. Uh, we run it together. I would be remiss to state that this is actually his presentation. Uh, these are his slides. I'm just uh, giving it. He unfortunately couldn't make it uh, this time, but he was, I know he was here last year and really appreciated everything that Drove and everyone's doing. Um, so we're going to discuss primary lymphedema today. At our uh, program, we actually see both primary and secondary lymphedema. Um, even though we're Boston Children's, uh, our oldest patient is 97 years old uh, there, so they're still, they're still kids at heart. Um, but so we've already kind of discussed this, so I'll move quickly through some of these. But lymphedema, you have primary, you have secondary. The overall majority of individuals have secondary lymphedema, and, and as we've already discussed, it's uh, mainly due to infection worldwide, but in the United States, it's secondary to cancer treatment. However, trauma and obesity can also uh, actually cause lymphedema. Now, on the primary side, it's idiopathic, and it only affects 1 in 100,000 individuals. And so to put some in perspective, roughly between 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 2,500 children are born with a cleft lip and cleft palate. So this is significantly more rare than something like that. It uh, normally affects the lower extremities, followed by the genitals, and then the upper extremities. So, uh, Horhan's a dear friend of ours as well. We've been able to be over to Melmer. So, this is a very famous uh, picture. And what it's really showing here is with the lymphedema pathophysiology is that the lymphatics are not working appropriately. So, what happens is the lymph fluid spills out. That's a very inflammatory process. And so, over time, this fluid, this edema that's occurring, actually becomes fat deposition and causes fibrosis. So, as we mentioned, has already been mentioned today, if you've had lymphedema for a significant time frame, your compressions are doing something, but they're not doing nearly as much to decrease because you actually have fat. I mean, we can all appreciate in this cadaver picture how much more fat the right affected is than the left. Adipose tissue can actually increase to up to over 73% compared to the non-affected leg. Now, uh, we have the bottom here, the staging. Uh, we agree with uh, Dr. Singal that we, we don't really use this very much, but it is the staging system. What we prefer is to classify it based on mild, moderate, or severe. Mild is any disease that if you have a single affected extremity, it's about less than 20% more than the normal side. Moderate is 20 to 40%, and severe is more than uh, 40%. So with primary lymphedema, 97% of our pediatric patients have the primary, meaning that 3% actually do get secondary for uh, different reasons, including biopsies of moles. Um, when I use pediatric here in this talk, I'm talking about patients that are 21 years and younger, and that's important because we actually have an adult population as well. As I already mentioned, it's an extremely rare disease, and I'm not nearly as good with analogies, so I can't do the train when uh, necessarily asthma, but the main thing is that Roughly most of these, 83%, the train tracks did not form appropriately, if you will. They're hypoplastic. But with 70%, there's actually too much train tracks, and so they're, none of them are working appropriately either. And that's where we really get our malformations and our syndromes. So when patients uh, present to us, roughly 12% will be either syndromic or have a family history of this. But interestingly, of all the family patients that present to us, only 30% have an actually identified mutation, even though we know it's genetics of some sort. It means that that's a very, this is a very, very heterogeneous uh, disease process. There are many, many different mutations that cause this. With the sporadics that uh, present to us, only 8% have been identified thus far. We have uh, significant collaborations with um, a group in Belgium that is doing all of the uh, genetics on this. But a few of the common conditions for individuals that have primary that may know are, of course, uh, Milroy, uh, Hennekens and Turners, I name one each one. One is dominant, one is recessive, and one is X-linked, meaning that it's not one size fits all for these. So with primary lymphedema classifications, the current classification slash the old way was to name it congenital precoxia and tarda. The problem is, depending on what center or what uh, scientist or what physician you're talking to, those can actually mean different things. So we choose strictly a developmental uh, classification, meaning infancy, birth to one year, childhood, 
adolescence, and adulthood. Um, so what we mean by that is that this child actually was born with lymphedema and it developed right at birth, so that's when we saw them. We've already discussed the lymphcinograms. I'll go a little bit more into that. But for this individual, she actually developed around eight years of age, her lymphedema, compared to this individual who was uh, 40 years before they actually first developed their, I'm sorry, 30 years before they uh, first developed. So the epidemiology of primary lymphedema. It actually affects males and females uh, equally. 91% of people that have primary lymphedema are younger than 21 years. It almost always affects the legs, with roughly 50% of the time it being bilaterally. Interestingly, the patients that we have that have upper extremity lymphedema uh, at least half of them actually have a leg affected as well. And that goes up even more for the genital. So of the 4% of patients that come to us with primary lymphedema of their genital, 96% of them also have an affected uh, leg. This is a progressive disease, but um, when we don't know necessarily why yet, um, only roughly 50, uh, half of the patients will actually progress over time. There are key ways to stop uh, the progression and we'll, or to minimize it, and we'll go over that here late, uh, in a little while. Um, Children that are born in infancy, overall two-thirds of these are boys that develop it at that time period, and they're most likely bilateral, compared to females normally present with a development during adolescence, and it's, uni and it's usually unilateral. The small percentage of adult onset lymphedemas we actually just uh, studied and uh, just recently published on was that the mean age of development was actually roughly around 40 years. The lower extremity still was more affected than the upper at 85%. However, what was really interesting was 15% of these people actually came to us with an upper extremity lymph primary lymphedema and had no leg involvement compared to our uh, normal, at least 50% have a leg involvement. We, this has already been discussed, and I, I, I think we have, I guess, similar experiences at our program to yours because we actually looked at our first 387 patients that came through the door, and 25% of them actually did not have lymphedema. Just because you have a swollen extremity does not mean you have lymphedema, especially for children. It's 1 in 100,000, so it's actually very rare. So I know there are some clinicians in the room. So it's very important when you see a patient that you, do, that you really think of the full differential diagnosis. This is the only individual in this picture that actually has lymphedema. All these other children have different types of either vascular anomalies, um, lipidema that we'll hear more about. One actually has a hemihypertrophy, so half of their body is overgrown in general. They have obesity, or they could even have rheumatological uh, diseases. So once again, just because they're swelling does not mean that it's lymphedema. Lymphedema, is a, a, as you all know in this room, is a very specific disease. So going into that more, history and physical exam is extremely important. In fact, with the appropriate history and physical exam, 94% of all patients can be accurately diagnosed. When we're taking a history, we're very interested to know if the patients have ever had cellulitis in their swollen extremity, and also if they have a family history, especially for uh, children. On physical exam, Lymphedema normally always affects the distal part of whatever you're talking about, whether it be the leg or the arm. So feet and hands are normally affected first, and then it progresses up approximately. Um, in the early stages, you have pitting edema. So, uh, but then in the, in the later stages, because of the fat fibrosis, it actually just goes away. We don't really find that pain is that uh, normally a main symptom, but once again, the differential diagnosis is huge. We have cardiac, renal, hepatic issues, vascular anomalies, or even just obesity or lipedema. Lymphcinogram is the gold standard for confirmation of these tests. We actually uh, created a protocol that was published and is now used across the United States for diagnosing using uh, or confirming using lymphedema. Um, sorry, lymphcinograms. We use a technetium 99 sulfur colloid. So what that basically means is it's a radio-labeled uh, colloid that we inject, as we mentioned, in the second and fourth webs of both of the extremities to determine the flow, whether it be legs or arms. That can only be taken up by the lymphatics. It can't be taken up by the veins or the arteries, so that's why we know it's accurate. Um, we define abnormal, abnormality as, this is normal, so within uh, 45 minutes, both the inguinal lymph nodes were l uh, lit up appropriately. Compared to an abnormal, after two hours, there was no inguinal lymph nodes, but also we saw that there was actually pushback, and there was actually dermal backflow here. This is an extremely safe procedure. There's actually no risk for infections and allergies and some of the others um, that can occur, but not with the lymphcinograms. And as I mentioned, we actually are, have an evidence-based protocol with a 96% sensitivity and 100% specificity, meaning that if 
it shows that you have delay or dermal backflow, then you have lymphedema. Um, Interestingly, all of our false negatives were in primary. We're currently studying that right now. We find that a year later, half of those actually develop a uh, actual positive lymphcentogram, meaning that they do have the disease. <clears throat> of course, there's morbidity with uh, lymphedema. Uh, I am showing you, though, some of the, our more severe patients. There are many patients that ha do, not ha do not suffer this at all. The number one is psychosocial, but following that is infection. All patients, both secondary and primary, have a 70 times increased risk of infection. So it's extremely important to have appropriate skin hygiene. It's important to wear product protective clothing if you're out in the woods or even just walking around barefoot outside. Um, we do find that around 5% of our patients have complaints of functional problems such as ambulation or fitting in a clothes, and uh, skin changes do occur. Very, very, very infrequently we'll have a patient that develops lymph, uh, lymphangiosarcoma, but that's a very rare uh, part. Interestingly, with primary lymphedema, only 50% of patients actually progressed in enlargement to up to a seven-year follow-up study thus far. With 25% of patients that when they first developed lymphedema, they only had one leg, but up to a year to two years later, it actually came into the other leg as well. So we've discussed this uh, somewhat, and we'll just go over it a little bit more here. The first treatment choice for all lymphedema is conservative management. Um, very importantly, though, both for primary and for secondary, we also want to encourage a normal body mass index, which means a normal weight. There's been many studies that have shown that weight can actually in, uh, adversely affect lymphedema, both with breast cancer, but also we've now published on that mass obesity can actually cause lymphedema on its own. Here's a perfect example that a woman, these are both uh, females, roughly the same age. They both have right primary lymphedema. This individual has maintained a normal body mass index of 23, and over seven years, this is how her leg it looks. Compared to this individual who, um, by the uh, current medical standards, would be considered uh, obese, has had significantly so more severe uh, progression over just a two-year time frame. So besides, of course, exercising, the other purpose on exercising besides it's great to have normal bodies, you're helping your lymphatics. You're, the muscles are contracting, which is pushing the lymphatics against gravity back up to your heart. The other thing that we already mentioned was, of course, skin hygiene and protective clothing. We also do custom-fitted garments. For individuals that have never used garments, we've actually found a 50% reduction in the first year of treatment because mainly this is fluid filled. It's edema and so we can get rid of that. There is of course also complex uh, lymphedema therapies. We do not prescribe antibiotics chronically unless patients have suffered uh, several um, inpatient cellulitis episodes. There is, of course, also operations. That's one reason why plastic surgeons are involved in this as well. At our center, we find that roughly only about 5% of our patients actually require that. The indications, of course, are to fail true conserved therapy. So we want to make sure that for at least a year they've actually been doing the conservative therapy. Potentially they have a significant amount of recurrent cellulitis. If they have um, impaired functions, of course, we will as well. Our pre-operative uh, workup is for every patient is to get a lymphcentogram. But for any patients we're going to operate on, we want to get an MRI first because we want to make sure that they actually have enough fat there. Because what we practice is uh, what Dr. Singal mentioned, the suction-assisted lipectomy or liposuction. We also do water displacement for those individuals to really measure how much more the affected versus unaffected extremity is. And then we uh, get baseline photographs and post-operative photographs. So with our suction cyst lipectomy, the main takeaways here are that we actually do not operate on the feet or on the hands. We start distally at the ankles or at the wrist and then move proximally. For the uh, arms, it's normally a completely outpatient procedure. And for the legs, we really just keep them uh, overnight and they go home the next morning. We ace wrap them for six weeks because what's happening here is we have removed all this uh, fat and now there's more fluid going on. So we want to get them back down to a new normal baseline. But like Dr. Singal mentioned, we still have them in compression wrap. So after the six weeks, they then get remeasured and have a completely new baseline for their disease. So these are several patients that Dr. Green has operated on with primary uh, lymphedema. You can see uh, both uh, on preoperatively all the way to postoperatively. Um, 
I'll just go through a few of these. Um, so this is showing uh, that at two hours uh, she had failed and had diagnosed of, of lymphedema, and then she does have significantly more fat than on her affected versus her left versus her unaffected. So we elected to operate on this individual. Uh, one additional one to, to review here that's uh, unilateral, and you can really appreciate in her both at the ankle level, at the lower extremity, but even at the upper extremity, the change. And the, these are each at least two to three years uh, postoperatively, uh, by the way. Now, this individual actually had a bilateral primary lymphedema of uh, affecting his entire lower extremity. So in the first postoperative picture, we've only done uh, this side, and then we waited six, uh, six weeks to three months, and then came back in and did the other side as well. Now, a lot of times when we first were doing uh, liposuction, we thought for sure that for the more severe patients, we would need to also, uh, after the liposuction, and we sucked out the fat, if you will, we would be able, we'd need to excise the skin um, because there would be redundant skin in place. And so for this individual, we thought for sure that would certainly be the uh, the fact. But interestingly, the skin is very elastic, as I'm sure any women who have given birth know that they can, the skin can actually uh, contract back down for your stomachs afterwards. Same regard for lymphedema, actually. So after the liposuction, we had her wrapped appropriately, and her skin elasticity completely came back in, and she didn't require, nor did she want, a second surgery. But what we found uh, recently, we actually just published in the New England Journal uh, a year ago, is that not only does uh, liposuction assist by the fact that we were removing a tremendous amount of fat uh, in the extremities, whether it be the legs or the upper extremities, we actually are assisting in creating more lymphatic function. As I mentioned earlier, we do not operate on the feet or the hands. So this is a patient postoperatively, she had severe dermal backflow. I'm sorry, preoperatively, she had severe dermal backflow. Postoperatively, she came to us and she stated that, you know, my feet, this is postoperatively, I mean preoperatively, this is postoperatively, she said, my feet feel so much better. And we had several other women who came to us and had secondary uh, disease from breast cancer, and they're like, I couldn't wear rings beforehand, but now I can wear my rings or my bracelets. What, what, what did you do? And we said, well, we don't, we don't even operate on your hands, so the lymphatic function must be improving somehow. So we started getting uh, postoperative lymphenograms on each of our patients, and you can see here that postoperatively, her dermal backflow is com uh, basically completely better. She she did, of course, still wear compression garments, but we were able to show that this is another way of actually improving lymphatic function over time. So in conclusion, speaking about primary lymphedema, it's extremely rare. Overall majority of patients uh, are 21 years or younger, and most of those uh, have a lower extremity affected. Interestingly, males normally uh, develop during infancy and it's bilaterally, and females normally develop during adolescence uh, unilaterally with uh, about a quarter of those becoming bilateral over time. For the clinicians in the room and also for the patients, an appropriate diagnosis with a history and physical examination can diagnose up to 94% of patients. But lincinogram is, of course, the gold standard for the radiological uh, portion and will give you 100% specificity on the disease. Our managements at Boston Children's are that we uh, start with conservative managements with garments, with a pneumatic pump as well, uh, appropriate protection of the skin, and then also we always uh, really talk about this is keeping a normal body weight. Some of our patients do require operative treatments as well, and so for those we use um, suction-assisted lipectomy. Uh, I'm extremely excited to look at the BCBS uh, 037 um, act that I hadn't, I didn't know about that yet. So we'll see if what was covered in here. Uh, a lot of our insurance actually is will cover our suction assisted lipectomies after many many years of fighting with them in Massachusetts. Um, but anyway, that is our conclusion for the Boston Children's Hospital's lymphedema program on primary lymphedema.